All right. Okay. Thanks, David. All right. So, so if you have a multinomial distribution, okay, uh, and you want to uh, find the maximum likelihood estimators for the proportions, right? Then you will add, you will experience, you will come across this Lagrangian constraint optimization because uh, your your probability your your proportions they sum to one. So you cannot simply just uh, uh, take the derivatives. Well, because if you, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, k categories, right? You only have k minus one degrees of freedom because uh, uh, the, the one of the, uh, so because they all sum to one, so one of them uh, cannot freely vary. So in that case, if you, if you rely on uh, standard methods, you, you will not be able to get results. So this Lagrangian uh, constraint optimization is, is actually a technique to, to overcome this problem, right? Um, yeah, unless you have learned it before, um, uh, otherwise uh, it's, it's just some technicalities and I, I don't think I want to go through it, right? Um, because um, it's kind of like peripheral anyway, okay? So anyway, um, We'll come to that later, right? Okay. So, so basically, okay. So, how do we find out this? Okay. So, the details we'll look at later, yeah. But uh, basically, the idea is like this. Um, so, I give you an example here. This is actually a real data set, right? Uh, and those are the principal components: uh, PC one, PC two. And they are already, um, you see that this, this data are actually uh, patients with certain kinds of uh, genetic defects, right? Um, some kind of mutations in their, their genes, okay? And you can see that they are linearly separable, which is very nice. Linearly separable on the uh, principal component space. And they are linearly separable, so you can build, uh, you can put lines on them, right? So... For example, you could put, um, uh, let's see, um, you can put, see, uh, there are many possibilities, right? You can put a line like this, line like this, line like this, whatever, right? Okay. So the problem is uh, how to, how to find the best line. Okay. And you don't want to use the linear, uh, regression method, right? The the one that we already looked at because it has some problems, right? It only um, so later we'll see see why this support vector machine is is flexible. <clears throat> okay, so so its criteria is like this. Uh, in this example, we say that this is a uh, hard margins, right? Because you don't have overlaps between the two uh, groups. The two classes don't overlap, so you can set something called a hard margin. A hard margin is a margin where after you set it, right, uh, over, so over, on one side of the margin, you will not find uh, members from the other class, okay? Right, this is the hard margins, right? You see the dashed lines here, these are the hard margins, okay? The hard margin will touch uh, the member from the, uh, let's say the red group, right, that is closest to the black group, okay? So we will touch those uh, points that are closest to uh, the other group, okay? So those uh, points are actually called support vectors. So these points, they are called support vectors. Okay? So there are three points here. And therefore, your, your decision boundary here, right? Your decision boundary is basically determined by only three points, these three points. All right, so this is the idea in um, support vector machine. Okay, um, and and so these are called support vectors. The vector is because uh, you know the data vector, right? X transpose is equal to some uh, maybe some values here, right? So this is a a vector, right? Um, so this is kind of like I um, so since it's bounding this this decision rule is kind of like like a support, right? So um, that's why they name it like this, support vector machine. The machine is for some kind of uh, indicate that 
some iterative process is, is uh, involved, okay? So it's a fancy name, yeah? Support vector machine. Uh, implementation in R, there are, there are several implementations in R, right? Um, the one that later we, we will actually look at um, is a Kern Lab, right? K-E-R-N-L-A-B. Okay. The one that we might use later for some work, right? Some sample script and all that. Okay, so so uh, so to in order to get this line uh, later, we will look at the uh, theory a little bit. Okay, um, at least we know some get some ideas how it is done. But this is a general idea. Okay, then um, the next slide. How do I move to the next slide? everything uh, two minutes Okay, now uh, those, okay, if you only rely on uh, soft margins, it's very rigid. Uh, the uh, support vector machine will not be so useful because most of the time you will come across, uh, for real data, you'll come across overlaps. Okay, so here you, you can see this is the example with the Wisconsin uh, breast cancer data, right? You recognize the Concave points mean and symmetry mean, right? So this is just an example for illustration, right? So because of that, they have something called soft margins, right? And for soft margins, you can see the following. So this soft margin, right? Uh, in between the boundary and the soft margin, you will find some kind of uh, overlaps, right? The blue will cross over and the red will cross over, okay? So this is what we call a, a soft margin, all right? Um, this soft margin, you can control its uh, width by a parameter called the uh, complexity parameter, okay? It is a parameter that allows you to control how, uh, uh, how, how relaxed you want this, this uh, um, boundary to be, yeah? If you set something like 10, right, it's usually very relaxed, it's a very soft. Okay, um, it, when you set it to be large values, it becomes um, uh, tighter, right? Up to a certain point, after you set it higher, it, it doesn't go down further, okay? So, um, so when people say that they do support vector machine, right? Actually, uh, there are many parameters that they can tune. Eh? Uh, sometimes you say that like, some people use support vector machine and they get good results, some of them get not so good results and so on and so forth. It could be just an issue of uh, whether you know how to tune the tune the uh, parameters. Okay, so here you know this C parameter is is a complexity parameter for for soft margin tuning. So the smaller it is, then it generally it's wider. Okay, and uh, you tune it larger, then it becomes uh, tighter. So this this may be maybe too too liberal, okay? So yeah, so this may include quite a lot of uh, uh, mistakes, okay? So you should tune it to be a bit higher. But of course, if you tune it higher, there's uh, it takes more time to do some computation, I think. Okay. Now. Um, okay, so so with with the inclusion of the soft margin, it sort of like uh, improves the uh, linear linearity of of your SVM. Okay, that means uh, if you insist on hard margins, then then SVM cannot really be useful for actual work. However, um, this is still not enough. Okay, um, you find that in in a lot of situations, you will have uh, 
in a lot of situations, you are going to have um, non-linearly separable classes. And this, this will be the main class that you can expect to see, right? Non-linearly separable. Okay, so um, so what what is the the solution to this? So the solution is to find some kind of a transformation, right? Okay, so in the original space, it is not uh, linearly separable, fine. But perhaps if you transform them, you take them to another space, then they they are they might be actually linearly separable in that space. All right. So this is a, a, a useful idea to think of, right? The variable that you are given, okay, not, not uh, linearly separable. Okay, take them to a different space. All right, you do a transformation. And in the transform space, you might find some kind of linear function, right? That does the separation. Then after you have found that linear separation, you back transform, right? So you, you then, uh, you will get a non-linear rule on the original space, okay? So this is the idea and it is called the uh, kernel trick for SVM. Okay, so the example here is given some, some uh, distribution of uh, data like this. All right, okay. So, uh, so, so these two classes are definitely not uh, linearly separable, yeah? If you, try to put any line through it, straight line. You cannot separate them without any, uh, without uh, having errors, okay? But it seems like these two groups are very easy to separate, right? You just need to use some non-linear decision rule, okay? So why should you be constrained by a linear rule, right? You, you should be, your tool should be flexible, isn't it? Okay, so here it seems like uh, maybe something that's curved, right? Maybe something circular. Well, not exactly circular, but maybe like something like an ellipse, right? like an oval shaped. So maybe something that's uh, like an ellipse like this. Uh, let me see. Uh, annotate. Maybe some ellipse like this. Okay, so uh, so over here, uh, the idea for the data just now is like this. You transform them, yeah? Okay, do a transformation. So take them to x square and this one take to y square. So basically, basically this is just x2 square and this is x1 square. Okay. So after you take them to the square, then you see that uh, you could actually put a, a straight line like this. Right. So, so, so you have your support vectors here, something like this, okay? So you could already separate. And once you have estimated all the uh, parameters, right? You have estimated uh, all the parameters uh, for this. So you estimate this and you estimate this, right? Using this in, uh, using the data in this transform space, you can basically then map back, right? Okay. So you, when you map back, um, in this case, uh, the function is actually an ellipse. All right. So this is the general idea and, uh, and uh, support vector machine has uh, several choices of uh, what we call the kernel functions, right? So we'll look at uh, kernel functions in more detail now. Okay. Um, let's see, kernel functions.
<clears throat> share screen. Okay. Yeah, okay. So this is, I'm just going to talk about the, go through the theory a bit. Uh, don't worry about the technicalities. They are just, uh, we don't examine on such things, yeah. Um, but but it's good to know, to have some idea how the math actually works, right? Focus will be more on um, knowing how to use the tools uh, properly. Okay, so again, that this is your hyperplane, right? Um, so same idea. You want to um, estimate these parameters, right? The the load, so the, the weight uh, vector, yeah? Okay, from data. Okay, so, um, so then uh, the challenge for, I say here, the challenge of finding a reasonable hyperplane is to determine some appropriate constraints that optimize certain desirable class separation properties, okay? Because in principle, you have so many possibilities, okay? So you must decide on certain objective criteria, like linear, uh, for, for example, linear regression uses the least square method, okay? So here, if you want to come up with a new method, then you have to figure out some uh, reasonable optim op objective function, which is doable, yeah? I mean, there are many possibilities, but the one that you propose must also be numerically feasible and easy to do, and maybe also not that hard to understand. Okay, so um, this method is actually uh, proposed by two people called uh, Vapnik and uh, Cortez, Cortez, right? Um, so uh, they propose that the hyperplane, right, should be estimated in such a way that the distance of the closest observations from each class to one in the direction of uh, WT is as large as possible. So, so what does this mean? Okay, maybe uh, let me sketch something here. So, so basically you have, um, so you have data points like this, right? Okay, the closest distance of the closest observation from each class to the decision rule. So in this case, my decision rule may be like this. So let's say this is my decision rule, right? So the, so the uh, closest observation will be those at the edges, uh, right? Like for example, this, this guy and this guy, okay? in the direction of WT, so, so in this direction, right? So, so, so uh, following this, this line, this vector. Um, sorry, uh, wait, okay. For, sorry, um, WT is orthogonal to that, oh, sorry. So WT, so this is your WTX equals to T, so, uh, orthogonal to it, so the direction of WT means uh, in this direction, in, a, in the 90 degree direction to it, okay. <clears throat> okay, so here you will have, uh, therefore you have two, two uh, boundaries. So one will be here, it will touch. So that will be the margins, right? The other one will be here. So they are just touching the, the two points which we call uh, support vectors, right? So this is called a support vector. So this is also called a support vector, okay? All right, so, um, so the, the margin, right? So this, this length here, right? This length here is called the uh, margin. 
2m over this thing. This is what we call a norm, right? This norm of a vector is, uh, is equal to the norm of this thing is equal to the square root of w1 square plus until uh, wp square, right? p is the number of variables you have. So basically this is a, a norm, yeah? The norm of the vector w, okay? So norm is just basically uh, meaning this thing. All right, okay. So, so basically you, you want to find, okay, I mean like over here, I, I suppose that I've already found it. But uh, my idea is that I have to find, I have to uh, set this as uh, uh, my objective function. Okay. So my idea is I have to find these two, some points such that uh, this quantity is uh, maximized. Right, because I want this uh, distance to be as much as possible, yeah? So I, I, it becomes a maximization problem. You want to maximize this objective function, okay? With respect to the parameters, the field, okay? This M is a constant, so you, you can ignore it, yeah? Uh, since M is an arbitrary constant, we just set it at some value, it doesn't matter. So if you want to maximize this uh, uh, objective function, it's the same as minimizing this. Okay, it's the same because uh, when your uh, denominator is minimized, then this objective function is maximized, okay? So as you can see, uh, the idea is, you see how the mathematics come in here. They, uh, those things like maximization, minimization that you learn, right? Uh, when you're doing undergrad studies, um, they are useful when it comes to uh, things like this. When you try to, uh, decide a rule, right? So you have to optimize certain things. And then, um, then the problem becomes like an optimization problem, like finding minimum, finding maximum. Okay, those kind of, uh, those kind of abstract techniques now uh, suddenly acquire some kind of um, meaning, okay? Because it can be, then be used uh, to do something that is practically useful. Okay. So, uh, so basically we have, uh, so I say here, maximizing the margin is equivalent to this thing subject to a constraint. So, so uh, in, in support vector machine, they put a constraint, right? They put this constraint, which is the class uh, label multiplied by the, uh, uh, this fact, so this boundary, right? has to be larger than or equals to one, right? They set this uh, as a kind of a constraint so that your omega, so, so that your, your uh, W will have certain structure, okay? Okay, so, um, so minimizing this is actually difficult because uh, it involves a square root, but uh, you can simplify the problem by minimizing uh, the square of the norm, right? Because the square of the norm is basically the square, the sum of squared uh, w's, which is uh, easier to do than let's say you put a square root on it. Okay, so equivalently, we maximize the uh, uh, square of the norm, right? So, so basically, you're trying to find uh, the values of w and t, the arguments that actually minimize this quantity. Okay, so these are your parameter estimates. And because you come across constraint optimization, you will need to use the Lagrange multipliers. Okay. Um, so maybe I clear. Okay. Right, okay, so you use Lagrange multipliers. Um, so basically, I, I don't want to go through this part. Um, if you're interested, you can read up something about Lagrange multipliers, right? But I, I'm not going to ask you about this thing because it's only specific to this particular problem. Okay, so um, this is just to show you um, how the optimization is done.
Okay. So you have the Lagrange. So the Lagrange things. Uh, so you finally uh, express the objective function with the Lagrangian parameter, right? And then you take the derivatives and then you form multiple equations. And then you can, uh, wait. you can then basically solve the, then you basically can get the uh, solutions for your WTs, right? Um, up to a certain point, so you will have to use numerical uh, optimization, right? To optimize this uh, particular function, the lambda, the Lagrangian, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Lagrangian, right? This formula. Okay, so you finally get this formula and you want to optimize numerically for alpha. So, so basically you want to find uh, values of alpha, alpha i and alpha j such that this uh, Lagrangian is as large as possible. Okay, with, uh, of course we're subject to some constraints here. So this uh, basically is a numerical optimization problem which you basically use some computer package to, to do. Right. So these are the uh, notes. Uh, in case, uh, just to refresh you, right? If you are not familiar with these notations. Okay, so um, so the point of here is that we we know that these parameters are uh, can be obtained, right? These alphas can be obtained, and once you obtain your alpha, then you will know your uh, W, right? Because your W is uh, it's a function of alpha. So after estimating alpha, then you will successfully get estimates for your Ws, okay? Right, because the only parameter for your W is actually alpha. All right, okay, so, so, um, so that's, that's the idea, right? So that's the math that goes into finding the, um, uh, the weight vector that allows you to plot that decision rule, yeah? Okay. Now, the more important, okay, so this part is the soft margin. So soft margin, basically, um, the soft margin part, they, they add certain, uh, what we call a slack variable, okay, into the uh, constraints, right? So then you get some additions there, and then um, so then it changes the minimization problem slightly, right? So now you also have to estimate the slack parameter. Okay. Um, so basically, then uh, you have more things like you have the uh, slack parameters inside. So then you can see that this uh, this C is is is. Uh, yeah, so this is where your C comes comes in. Um, then I say here, a large C corresponds to a smaller margin and vice versa, okay? So this C is some kind of a penalty uh, function, okay? You want a smaller margin, increase your C, right? You want a larger margin, you increase your, um, so you, you, if you want a smaller margin, you increase your C, and if you want a, a larger margin, you decrease your C, okay? <clears throat> so these are, again, a constraint optimization. You will have to deal with the Lagrangian. And, um, and again, uh, so once you have worked out all the equations, then you have to do the optimization, right, uh, numerically. Okay, so, so that takes care of the, uh, I, I mean, uh, this, this gives you some kind of, a con at least some kind of general idea, right? Uh, it's actually not easy to follow the algebra carefully um, in such a short time. So if you want to, you can actually uh, read it to, to follow the algebra. Okay. okay. Okay, the important part is um, the kernel. Okay, let me see, what's the kernel? H, three, four, okay. The, okay, for page four, okay, the kernel trick. 
So this is the part that uh, makes SVM uh, powerful, the use of a kernel function. Okay, what's a kernel function here? Okay, let's look at this. Suppose you have two data vectors, right? Um, you've got the, these two data vectors and um, so you can map the two dimensional data in the original space into a new space, right? Three dimensional. You map to something like this, uh, let's say for example. That means you, you square your X, you square your Y, and then you take square root of the product of X, Y. Okay, so that means uh, from two dimensional, as from the original uh, variable here, right? You go to x1 square, y1 square, and square root of two times x1, y1. So just to give some example, you will basically do something like this. Okay, rotate like for example, if you're If your x1, t is equal to 1, 1, and your x2, t is equal to maybe, let's say, 2 minus 1, then uh, you can do this uh, uh, mapping, and you will go to 1, 1, square root of 2, right? Okay, so you can, you can do this, and this you and go to, um, you square it, right? So you get four, you square this, you get one, then you get a uh, square root of two times two times minus one, right? So you get this, okay? So basically, if you have a plot like this, uh, this is one, one, the other is uh, two minus one is here, right? So it basically goes to uh, a different space, right? From here, x, y, so it goes to some space, x square, y square, right? And then uh, something square root of two, x, y. Okay, so it takes this guy. So, so it takes this point and it goes to one, 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 one square root of two, maybe here. Okay, so it's somewhere here. It takes this guy and moves here. And uh, the other one, you take this guy and move to four, one minus that. So that will be something four, one, Minus, so it'll be below here. Right. Goes here. Okay, so it's basically uh, making some kind of a uh, transformation. Okay, so the usual part is basically we only do uh, we only do transformation for the original variables, but here you kind of like you add add in one more um, variable, right? Which depends on uh, these two original variables. And over here, the function is uh, you take square root and then you multiply it together, right? So that's the function, okay? So then uh, the dot product of these two feature vectors is related to the dot product of their corresponding vectors. So for example, if you take a uh, dot product, so that means uh, you multiply these two vectors, yeah? This x1, x2. Um, to be conformable, so one of them is not transpose. So this is the same as, uh, it's related, right? Uh, so you get x1 transpose, x2 square, okay? So, so this dot product is the same as the square of the, um, the square of the dot product at the original uh, scale, yeah? Okay, so we call a function that computes the dot product in feature space directly from the vectors in the original space, a kernel function. Okay, so this is what a kernel function means. It's basically a function 
that computes the dot product in feature space. So in the example here, we use the quadratic kernel function. Right, so the quadratic kernel function, basically it takes x1 and x2 um, and produces this thing. All right, so how do you determine uh, what function is basically, uh, so if you have a quadratic uh, kernel function, that means you will end up, you will end up with something like this. Okay, so then you back, uh, you back transform. So, so this is what you want. You can then uh, expand it and then you can see this. Okay, and then you can recover this. Okay. So when you say that you have a polynomial kernel uh, used, all right, uh, sorry, a quadratic kernel, then basically you are saying that you are generating this particular, uh, you're generating this particular kind of transformation. It not only generates these two part transformations, but there's an additional part here. Okay, so, so it's entirely determined by this uh, kernel function. Okay, so by specifying the kernel, certain kernel functions, you will basically uh, go to certain space, right? So for example, over here, it may go to different spaces, yeah? So this may be a, some, so this may be a polynomial kernel. It will go to this space. If you have some other kernels, it will go to some other space, okay? So the idea is that um, we basically use the uh, kernel function that takes the original data to a space where things are more or less linearly separable. Okay, that's the idea. All right. Let me, okay, so let's clear this. Okay, so, um, so for the rest, I think, uh, how do you get the, the decision uh, boundary that you saw just now, right? That uh, ellipse, okay? So, so basically, first thing is that we, we rewrite the uh, decision boundary equation one. Let's look at it. So equation one, um, okay. So the decision boundary equation one, where is it? So this is the equation, okay? So this is the decision boundary, right? So, so that equation you, okay. Okay, so for that uh, decision uh, boundary equation, um, Okay, so here you have two quantities. Um, the first quantity is this. Okay, the vector P. Okay, uh, P is the mean vector of samples with positive labels and N is the mean vector of samples with negative labels. So um, in the PowerPoint example, we, I constructed it such that I have these two uh, features. Uh, these two characteristics, right? So then basically um, when you make some kind of replacement, all right, um, you can rewrite you, the decision boundary, you can get this equation. And from here you will apply the uh, quadratic kernel, right? Quadratic kernel applied on this data. So it takes in the, so, so these are your date, these are your original, variables, okay, original variables. So you, you put them inside as input to the kernel function. So this one the same, 
And this is your kernel function. This is a quadratic uh, kernel, right? The quadratic kernel will have uh, the square term. So once you have this uh, with the quadratic kernel, um, you simplify this, you do some algebra, your seven will become uh, some formula like this. Okay, it becomes a formula like this. And then uh, you simplify it, you can actually get uh, this equation. Okay, so this equation, if you remember your, um, if you remember some of your geometry studies, this is an ellipse. Okay, maybe um, maybe even multivariate statistics because uh, ellipses are common in when you deal with multivariate uh, normal distributions. You, then your confidence uh, region is actually an ellipse. Okay. So maybe you have come across that uh, in your multivariate course. Okay, so this is this defines a geometry object which is uh, basically an ellipse. You have uh, x square, you have y square, and you have your x y. Okay, so um, so basically again, uh, this a b c they correspond to certain uh, parameters, and of course uh, these parameters can be estimated, right? So they they depend on alpha, they depend on beta. Okay, so all these parameters can be estimated um, like uh, what we did just now with, with the uh, uh, Lagrangian, okay? So of course it will go through some very technical things, but um, the idea is that uh, it can be estimated, right? Okay, so, um, so over here, uh, Over here, if I say if C is equal to zero, then you basically have an ellipse, right? Okay, so that's the general idea for, um, that's the general idea for, for your kernel function, okay? Okay. So then uh, what are the other possibilities? So there are some other, so, so let's look at some commonly used uh, kernel functions. I think um, the common ones, they have, um, of course your kernel function can be linear, right? So the default is a linear kernel function, which is your, it will go to the linearly separable SVM. And then uh, you have the, you can use the polynomial and then you can also use the Gaussian kernel. The Gaussian kernel looks like this. Okay. So, um, so in terms of, uh, in two dimensional case, uh, basically it reduces to this, right? This looks like your Gaussian. It looks a bit like your um, product of uh, Gaussian densities, right? Without the uh, constant. Okay, so, right, so, uh, so, so sometimes if you make a transformation of your data using the Gaussian kernel, um, it may go to a space where, where it's linearly separable. Now, some, you might be asking like, so, so why are certain um, kernels uh, uh, proposed? And because in principle, you can have all kinds of kernels, right? Uh, yes, the, one of the reason is some of these kernels are proposed because of uh, the, the, the math will be, it's a model, right? So you want to work with something that, that leads to a clean transformation and not something terribly complicated, right? So, so um, they usually have a set of um, uh, kernels that are commonly used, right? And um, if you want to have your own kernel, you have to write it yourself and then do the optimization yourself. And I think nobody wants to do that, right? So, so because of that, um, the kernels that are available are the uh, linear kernel, okay? In R, that's called the vanilla dot, right? Um, vanilla means original. Then polynomial kernel, right? Poly dot, 
uh, Gaussian kernel RBF dot. Okay. Uh, it's also called radial basis function. Radial basis function is uh, your Gaussian kernel. And hyperbolic uh, tangent kernel, right? Uh, T, uh, hyperbolic, hyperbolic tangent, T-A-N-H dot. Okay. So hyperbolic function is uh, basically, so this is your hyperbolic function, hyperbolic tangent is um, some function like this. So your your hyperbolic function x is um, uh, e of x plus this divided by two. Uh, sorry, it's a minus. Have you come across? Have you learned uh, hyperbolic functions before? Oh, here. Huh? I seen it, but never know what is that. This this uh, shine cosh. Usually, they will learn it in the calculus course. Huh? Have you come across anyone? It it well. This this hyperbolic function is basically just a uh, fun uh, some kind of uh, linear combinations of exponential functions. So, uh, but then they they uh, they use this kind of notation the the shine and cosh because because they have some identities that are very similar to your trigonometric identities. Okay, um, so that's why they use this terminology, uh, and a lot of the definitions are very similar to your trigonometric function. So, so this transformation is basically this is like like trigonometry. This is tangent. So this is sine and cos. So it's using the analogous uh, form. So you have shine and cosh. So basically then this becomes uh, basically just a ratio like this. Okay, it's, it's nothing complicated, uh, this thing. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the kernel function. I mean, this is a function, right? So the kernel, it will take in. So for example, if you take uh, this as the kernel function, k, x1, x2, um, that will be, uh, it will take, uh, it may take, it will be some kind of uh, function like that will involve the uh, hyperbolic uh, tangent, right? Uh, for details, you might have to check some text. I, I'm not very sure what's the exact form here. Okay. Okay, just now. Did somebody make a comment just now? I'm trying to get the uh, comment box back. Okay, so I'm looking at the comments. Um, okay, yeah. So some of you may have come across, right? Never mind, okay. So just, uh, this just for some, just to survey a bit, right? So, okay. Um, Okay, so um, basically, all right. So just to maybe just uh, complete the the discussion about the uh, the technical parts. So so when you do kernelization, uh, what happens is that you have this thing. So when you do kernelization, uh, your alpha hats, right? They are found by uh, maximizing this thing. So your kernel function get inserted here. 
Okay. So this uh, part is actually similar with the previous part. When you do kernelization, the kernel function comes in here. Okay, and you have some, you have the constraints. So your constraints you see here, are your C. Yeah? So this is your complexity parameter, right? So uh, if you change this, then the value of alpha will change uh, because uh, it's constrained by your C, all right? So that's why um, only certain kernel functions are admitted, yeah? Because you see here, if, if your function here, your kernel function is very complicated here, then it will affect this, this objective function, all right? Uh, and your numerical optimization may not give you something that is stable. That's why um, there are not many choices for your linear, for your kernels. So you, uh, quadratic usually well behaved. Uh, Gaussian also usually well behaved, right? Uh, something that is associated with the normal density is usually well behaved. And also this one, because it's got something to do with exponential function, so uh, it usually is also well behaved. So that's why they only have this kind of like not many choices, lah, only this this few. There are a few more, but I think they are not very, there might be a sigmoid, uh, yeah, I think there's a sigmoid kernel function, right? The sigmoid function will be something like this. Again, based on uh, uh, exponential functions, okay? This will be sigmoid. All right. So, uh, in application, how do we use these things? In application, when you run SVM, right? Uh, <laughs> Generally, you will activate, um, you basically will try, of course, the linear, right? You will try a few things like the linear, um, and maybe at least you might want to try this uh, too. Try a linear, then try a polynomial, then try a Gaussian. Okay, and then uh, you, you decide which one is, uh, uh, giving you better performance, and then you pick the one. Right? So when you say you want to do support vector machine, right? It's actually um, not just not just simply doing uh, the standard vanilla uh, the linear kernel because that may not your data may not be linearly separable. You see, so in fact uh, you have to try a few things, and then when you try a few things, you have to tune the C parameter. So in fact when that's why when people use a uh, support vector machine, right? If they do not tell you the parameters, what are the parameters that they use, right? This C parameters, uh, what kernel function they use, uh, it's very difficult to replicate their result, okay? Uh, because there are many possibilities. You don't know what, what parameter that they use. Maybe it's the default, maybe it's not, okay? So when you do this kind of, uh, use this kind of tools, make sure you document your, uh, document your, your classifier parameters. Right? So like your, your complexity parameter, document that, and your uh, kernel functions, you also document that. So of course, ideally, um, ideally you would want to be able to visualize your results, but um, generally this may not be possible because uh, in, in for real, real, real examples, yeah, because your final set of variables, right, is unlikely to be um, in in low dimensions, right? Uh, at least in, to your best, you may get something that is in having uh, five or six dimensions. So you will not be able to plot all those uh, diagrams that you saw just now. Those are toy examples to illustrate um, the, the concept, right? Of uh, how it actually estimates, uh, how it actually behaves, right? Um, so of course, when it's in high dimensional, then, then it's basically just a decision rule, right? So, so um, you cannot visualize it, okay? But uh, you know that it has a, a geometry that you can understand in, in, uh, if, if you have a low dimension. All right. So this is basically uh, your support vector machine. Um, so, 
So this is just the theory part that I want to talk uh, today. Um, you may need a bit of time to digest this, right? So uh, later in the week, I will give you uh, a few R codes, right? For you to run. Okay, those are basically some R codes that you use the KSVM to run um, some data sets, right? So that you know how to use it, right? To generate some, some results. Um, so you will try that and then next week, next week we come back and uh, we uh, look at the results, right? Like how to, how to do things in R with, with this uh, KSVM function. Okay, so later uh, this week I will post the, um, the R codes and then uh, you maybe can try it out during uh, when you have time, right? Okay, so any, any, any questions from you? Maybe a bit uh, overwhelming with the technical details. Yeah, but um, so the technical details, you, you just basically, you can just try to go through them, right? Uh, um, the important thing is to get a, a good feeling of, of how to tune the machine, right? It's just like driving a car, right? You don't need to be an engineer, okay, to really uh, know how to drive a car well. Right. But you need to know sufficient, uh, you need to have sufficient understanding of how the car actually works in order for you to, to drive it well, okay? So they, um, you don't need to know those mechanics, formula and whatever. Only the person who designed the car needs to know it, okay? Because uh, that would take, that actually takes a lot of effort. Yeah? So, so, and that's besides the point because for data mining, the, the uh the focus is on uh knowing the tool sufficiently well to use it well okay to to get um uh, important things out of uh data okay that that's the main aim but still you need to know a little bit uh, about the background which which actually helps all right Um, any anyone wants to ask if any questions? I think Hin Chun asked a question just now, which is regarding to GLM part. GLM part. <laughs> okay. Uh, The choice of family is based on the distribution of the response variable. Um, do you want to uh, talk about it, Hin Chun? Uh, no, actually, I, I think it's just a, a, a rule of thumb only, that's it. Yeah, just to clarify, if it's just a rule of thumb or something. I, yeah, I think I got it, uh, just to clarify. Mm. Well, if you, okay, so, so, uh, generalized linear model is some kind of a, uh, I think the, the main difference with uh, linear models is that it uses some kind of link function, right? Isn't it? The, uh, yes. The link function. So for logistic function is the, what's the link function? It's a log link. Oh, uh, yes. Log link, right. Because uh, I think the link function, it basically like the link function is like, um, 
So your the your is le so, so your logistic regression is linear uh, in the log of your odds, right? So the the link function is log. So I think uh, it there, therefore if you if you re, if you do the um, some kind of transformation, right? Then of course uh, you in, in that's why you get the the sigmoid function after you exponentiate both sides, right? Okay, you get something non-linear at the end. So the generalized linear model is basically is like okay, is 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 basically doing some kind of transformation to your um, response, some function that's applied to it, so that uh, it is linear in the predictors. Okay. Um, and then they talk about certain classes. I mean, um, so you can, because of that, you can basically put the logistic uh, regression into that family, right? Then you have those others. Um, if the response follows a Poisson binomial binary, then the family. And then how about the family? Uh, no, it's just in the R formula, there's a. GLM, then, yeah, I mean, it's a family option that you need to specify. Yeah. I think that's all. Yeah, that's just. It. Actually, I, is, I think there's a cost in generalized linear models. Um, in, I don't know, maybe it will run. Um, so maybe, I don't know, next semester, you can basically check to see if it's running. And you, if you're interested, you can take that cost. Then you will know more about the theory. But um, yeah, so okay, but we are not dealing specifically with GRM here, so so maybe yeah, may not be able to comment too much. Right? All right, okay. Um, so, okay, so I think it's uh, about time. So let's end here for today. All right. Okay, thank you, doctor. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>